Dead America, Seattle Part 7 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 9 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 26 Benny pulled his jacket over his shoulder, repositioning himself against the cheap sheetrock wall of the office to savor the last few moments of his nap. The sun would be up over the horizon soon, and the last several days had been exhausting. Every second he could have his eyes closed was precious. The door to the building opened up, and two soldiers walked inside, jabbering loudly with one another. Benny grumbled and shifted, trying to tune them out, and then finally sat up. Hey, assholes, he barked. People trying to sleep in here. So take it outside unless you want to join the ranks of the unconscious. The venom in the old man's voice made the two soldiers zip their lips and slowly back out of the room, closing the door behind them. This office had become an official napping room, so that the exhausted soldiers that needed some shut-eye between constant missions could get some rest. Ignorant fucks, he muttered, and let out a huff as he tried to get comfortable again. Alas, the damage had already been done. He was all riled up. He checked his watch. It was a little before seven. Twenty minutes before sunup, he thought bitterly. Might as well get the blood flowing. He pulled himself up off of the ground, bones creaking from the uncomfortable bedding, which was really just a few random blankets tossed on the floor. What he wouldn't give for a good night's sleep in an actual bed. With one of the few working transport helicopters, Benny had been constantly shuttling vital goods to the troops on the front lines of the war. This was the same job he'd had decades prior during Vietnam, and while he had to admit it was nice to not have to worry about return fire, it was still a drastic change from a month ago, running aerial tours of the region of Spokane. As he headed for the door of the napping room, he spotted a young soldier, no more than twenty, curled up under a desk. The kid shivered, hugging his knees, and Benny knelt down, laying his jacket over the kid like a blanket. He slipped out the door, shutting it as quietly as he could. The airfield was still a hive of activity, just like it had been since the invasion began. The only major difference from the beginning of the invasion was the lack of frontline troops running around, as they'd mostly all moved up. In their place were a couple hundred supply personnel, scrambling to unload trucks that had driven up from Spokane filled with goods. The supply lines were rough, to say the least. The rail lines that had been bringing in ammo and rations from God knew where stopped in Spokane. Benny had heard rumors of a derailment or something going wrong with the tracks, but it didn't really matter. The cold fact was that things had to be offloaded and put onto trucks which slowed things to a crawl. Everywhere Benny landed, the story was the same. Soldiers from privates all the way up to captains begging and pleading with him to bring them more ammo, more weapons, more of anything they could use to fight off the dead. Would be comical if it weren't so damn tragic, he thought as he walked through the airfield. Experienced soldiers begging and pleading with a retired civilian for what they need. Amazing it's come to this. Benny's eyes finally began to clear up, something that seemed to take longer and longer with each passing day. It was one of the many gifts that his sixties were giving to him. Able to focus, he spotted his helicopter in the middle hangar, receiving some work. There's my girl, he murmured. Let's see how they're treating you. His tour helicopter was large enough to fit ten full-grown adults, or at least it had been before the war. When the supply lines were faltering, a team of mechanics ripped out the seating to make room for more cargo. Benny really didn't mind it, since his aerial touring days were well behind him, but there was a part of him that was pained to see his baby torn apart like that. You boys treating her nice like a lady should be? He drawled as he approached the mechanics. Jerry smirked as he headed over in grease-stained coveralls, wiping his hands on a rag. Oh yeah, treating her better than I treated my wife, he replied. 
From underneath the helicopter, a muffled voice yelled, Ex-wife! Jerry chuckled and glanced over his shoulder. Yeah, well, this chopper isn't running around fucking the neighbors, he quipped. So of course it's getting better treatment. A chorus of laughter erupted throughout the mechanics in the hangar. Y'all make sure not to load me down too much, Benny declared as he watched a couple loading up wooden crates with a forklift. I gotta get that baby off of the ground. Jerry clapped him on the shoulder with his now clean hand. Don't worry, bud, he said. We're keeping a close eye on it. These soldier boys like to go for broke, but we ain't gonna let them put you in danger. The pilot smiled at him in thanks and then crossed his arms, turning back to his chopper. So, how's she looking? With as much flight time as she has on her, she's looking pretty good, Jerry replied. Long term, we're going to have to source some engine parts to make sure she keeps purring. But for right now, you're good to go. Benny nodded. So, what am I hauling today? Hell if I know, the mechanic admitted with a shrug. That pencil pusher David is around here somewhere. He's got the details. The pilot raised an eyebrow. Pencil pusher? He asked. Come on now, don't be too hard on the kid. If we had the shit they have today when we were his age, we probably wouldn't have gone outside much either. Jerry tilted his head back and forth, and then finally put up a hand. Yeah, I guess those drone things of his are pretty nifty, he begrudgingly said. Could get into all sorts of shenanigans with those. I've heard stories about you, Benny accused with a wink. Pretty sure you've gotten into enough shenanigans without the need for technology. They shared a hearty laugh and then turned as David skirted some toolboxes to get to them in the hangar. "'Looks like you two are in a good mood this morning,' he declared, raising a can of some kind of sugary energy drink in a toast before taking a sip. Jerry smirked. "'Yeah, we were just brainstorming ideas on the kind of fun we could have with your drones there,' he said. "'Well, once we survive this invasion,' David replied, leaning in conspiratorially. I'll break out some of the videos in my archive. He gave the mechanic a devious wink, and the two older men blinked at him. I'll be honest, Jerry said, putting up his hands. I didn't think you had that in you. The communications expert shrugged sheepishly. Well, you know, he replied, us pencil pushers are a lot more devious than people like to give us credit for. Benny gave the mechanic a playful slap on the back and Jerry's cheeks pinked as he burst out laughing. He shook his head. All right, you got me, he said, wrinkling his nose in embarrassment. I'll let you boys talk. Benny, you should be good to go in ten. He waved and headed over to the chopper to continue his pre-flight checks. So, what's on the menu today? The pilot asked, back to business after his friend getting busted. David took a long swig of his drink and smacked his lips. I hope you got some rest, because we got a busy one for you, he said. Two of the transports for the northern front are out of commission. Wait, what? Benny's brow furrowed in worry. What the hell happened? David put up one of his hands palm out. Don't worry, pilots are safe, he assured him quickly. One of the landing zones got overrun while they were unloading, so they had to abandon it for the time being. They're getting a handle on the situation, but it could be the afternoon or even into the evening before they can resume. They're going to need supplies before that, though. All right, I'll make that work, the pilot assured him. Where's the landing zone? David cocked his head. That one is still being determined, he admitted, and put up a finger. But you have a stop before that. He pulled out a piece of paper from his pocket and then turned around, spreading it out on the small desk behind them. This is the Renton Airfield, he explained as he pointed to an airport just south of Mercer Island, southeast from downtown. We were able to secure it yesterday and have a barricade set up on the interstate here to the east. There's a whole lot of trouble coming up the road towards them, but they need some heavy-duty stuff if they're going to hold it. That what they're loading up? Benny asked. David nodded. Yep, fifty cal rounds, he confirmed. 
These things are worth their weight in gold, and it's going to be a good long while before we can get our hands on more of them, so treat them well. It's not like we can just go into the super center and pick up a few boxes of ammo. Which is a damn shame, really, the pilot replied with a sigh. Could have had a lot of fun with that. David raised an eyebrow. I think we have different definitions of fun, he said dryly. I don't know, Benny drawled with a mischievous glint in his eye. I'm looking forward to your archives. They shared a laugh, and David took another long gulp of his drink. So, after I drop this stuff off, Benny asked, where am I headed? David pointed to the top left corner of the map. You need to head out to the field to the northwest, he explained. Captain McCall will have your next supply run ready and waiting. Sounds like it's going to be a fun day, the pilot declared, and stretched his arms above his head. On that note, you got anything for me? David nodded and pulled a tote bag from his backpack, handing it over. Benny dug through it, checking all of the MREs, as well as a couple of packs of snack food. All right, all right, looking good, he murmured, and then looked up. Now, what about my vodka? David's brow furrowed deep, pursing his lips in concern. The pilot burst into laughter, clapping him on the shoulder. Nah, I'm just fucking with you, boy, he admitted. You know damn well I'm a bourbon man. The communications expert shook his head, letting out a relieved chuckle, and reached into his pocket, revealing a silver flask and holding it out. Not while flying, he added. Wouldn't dream of putting my baby in danger like that. Benny assured him, stuffing the flask into his pocket and patting it, saving it for the end of the day, or some other special occasion. Good man, David replied. So, do you have everything you need? Benny nodded. I'm good to go. All right, well, David said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. I got half a dozen other things I'm already behind on. I'll see you when you get back. Good luck out there. They shared a nod, and the younger man headed out of the hangar to his next task. Benny reached into his tote bag and pulled out a slightly squished chocolate snack cake. He grinned and tore open the tasty treat. With his mouth full of squishy cake, he mumbled, Breakfast of Champions. Chapter 2 Benny flew relatively low over the suburbs on the way to the airfield. The tree-covered neighborhoods did a good job of hiding the horror on the streets, though every now and then there were breaks in the trees. He glanced down and saw asphalt littered with the dead. The glimpses were bad enough, but as he soared over a shopping center, a fuller picture emerged. Hundreds of corpses, maybe even thousands, sprawled across the parking lot mowed down and left to bake in the sun. Benny shook his head, unsure of how to even process this level of carnage. It was even more overwhelming knowing that this was happening all over the city. So much life just fucking wasted, he thought bitterly. It's a damn shame. He tried to focus on flying, pushing out memories of Vietnam, the same carnage of bodies sprawled across the ground easily seen from a bird's eye view. But this isn't Vietnam, he reminded himself. Those aren't people down there, at least not anymore. What's happening here is necessary and I got a job to do. A few miles out from the airport, he spotted the front line of the military, pushing forward street by street. Even over the noise of the blades, he could hear muffled gunfire, which hammered home just how prevalent it was on the ground. He glanced over, seeing a massive firefight holding back a few hundred creatures. If the front lines are this bad, he thought, what the hell is it like at the airport? He ascended, getting high enough to get a better lay of the land. He didn't have coordinates on the airport, so he had to rely on visual cues. As he rose higher, he spotted the interstate where the barricade was. There were cars lined up, bumper to bumper, with several fifty cal machine gun nests spread out across it. The nests were quiet, but several troops fired with standard assault rifles from the line, picking off zombies as they trickled towards the barricade. 
Once the immediate threat was eliminated, several soldiers hopped over the line and got to work, picking up bodies and moving them thirty yards away from the line and stacking them up. Benny shook his head, thinking it was futile to create another corpse barrier, but he supposed that anything that could slow the zombies down even a little bit couldn't hurt. Before looking for the airport, he flew down the interstate a little bit, just to see what was on the horizon. His stomach knotted and clenched, flipping end over end at the sight of a dense horde, easily in the thousands heading a couple miles up the highway. He immediately swooped around and searched for the airport. It took a few moments, but he finally located it, sitting on the edge of the water. It was a moderately sized airstrip, not big enough for 747s, but still bigger than the tiny regional airport like the one he'd just taken off from. As he approached the strip, he spotted someone waving lights to get his attention. He hovered over them, watching, as they motioned to the south end of the runway. He gave the soldier a thumbs up and then moved in that direction. He landed gently and powered down the engine before hopping down to the ground. As soon as his boots hit the ground, a few soldiers greeted him, the lead man holding out his hand to shake. Man, are you a sight for sore eyes, he declared. I'm Sergeant Farley. The pilot smiled and shook his hand. Benny, he replied. Good to meet you. Farley motioned to the men behind him to unload the cargo, and then turned back to Benny. Is everything for us? he asked. As far as I know, Benny replied with a shrug. Should be nothing but fifty cow rounds, and it looks like you boys are about to need it. The sergeant's brow furrowed. What are you talking about? he asked. I flew down the interstate a bit, the pilot explained, pointing, and you got a whole mess of those fuckers headed your way. Farley's eyes widened. How many we talking? A lot higher than my dumbass can count, Benny admitted, shaking his head. The sergeant immediately pulled out his walkie-talkie. We have a massive wave headed our way, boys, he barked into the receiver. Let's get that line secure as quickly as we can. Got more ammo headed up your way, too. Make it happen. Anything I can do to help? Benny asked. Farley cocked his head. Don't you have places to be? he asked. I do, the pilot admitted, drawing out the word. But if you can spot me some fuel, I'm sure I can find an excuse to be a little late. The sergeant cracked a smile and then reached out to grab the arm of one of the soldiers walking past to help with the unloading. There's a fuel truck at the north end of the runway he said quickly. Go straight up, and it's on the left. You can't miss it. Double time it up there and hurry back. Yes, sir, the soldier replied with a nod and took off running. Farley turned back to his new friend. How do you feel about bombing runs? Benny grinned. As long as I'm the one doing the dropping and not the one receiving, I'm good with them, he replied. Good man, the sergeant said, and then raised the radio to his lips again. Corporal Barnes, do you copy? There were a few seconds of silence before a voice came back. Little busy at the moment, Sarge, setting the stage for our unwelcome guests. I'll keep it brief then, Farley assured him. You want to come help me make some giant firebombs to drop on our guests? Hell yeah, I do, Barnes replied immediately. The sergeant nodded. Well, get your ass down here then, he demanded. We don't have much time with the chopper. On my way, the corporal replied. Benny cocked his head. So, what do you have in mind, Sergeant? Farley shoved his radio back into his pocket. You ever make a Molotov cocktail? Only when my neighbors were being assholes, the pilot quipped. The sergeant smirked. You ever make one out of five-gallon water bottles? He asked. A devious grin broke out on Benny's face. No, he admitted but looking forward to giving it a shot. Farley motioned for the pilot to follow him, and the duo headed over to a building beside the hangar. The sergeant led him inside, revealing a large kitchen and dining area, what once was an airport restaurant. In the back, there were a few offices surrounding a common room, a large table in the center, and a water cooler. Next to the cooler was a large rack holding numerous five-gallon plastic water bottles. Benny pulled one out, smacking the side a few times. Not sure what kind of Molotovs you were making, he drawled, but mine weren't made of plastic. 
Just means we gotta get creative, Farley replied. That's an understatement, the pilot quipped. What are you thinking? Farley pulled out a large knife, holding it up with a grin. Benny's eyebrows hit his hairline as he realized what the sergeant was insinuating. You got a set of stones on you, boy. I'll give you that, the pilot said, shaking his head. Just know you're paying for any fire damage to my baby. The sergeant shrugged. As my amateur daredevil cousin would say, he replied, fire damage builds character. He sounds like quite the ladies' man, Benny said, crossing his arms. Farley barked a laugh. Well, he was a star on the carnival circuit for a few years, he explained. So in his hick town, he was. Knew I messed up by moving to the big city, Benny replied, snapping his fingers. The sergeant chuckled. Come on, let's grab a few and get out there, he said. Borrow some of that fuel before your chopper soaks it all up. Chapter 3 you want to run that plan by me again? Barnes demanded, his eyes wide as saucers. Because if I heard what I think I just heard, I may have to have you committed. Farley and Benny stood next to the chopper. Four of the five-gallon plastic containers filled to the top with fuel. Several strips of cloth ran down the sides of the bottles connected at the top. The sergeant shrugged, motioning with his knife. Don't see what the big deal is, he said. You just light the top, stab the side of it, and push it out of the chopper. And what do you think is going to happen when the gas hits the open flame before it's out? The corporal demanded, crossing his arms. The other two exchanged a glance, and the pilot spread his hands, palms up. As a wise man once said, he began with a grin, fire damage builds character. Barnes scrubbed his hands down his face. God damn it he groaned. If I have to hear one more pearl of wisdom from your daredevil bumpkin of a cousin, you'll be all right, Benny assured him, patting his shoulder. Now let's get loaded up. I have places to be. The corporal reluctantly climbed aboard, with Farley close behind. Benny fired up the helicopter, waiting for the blades to whip up to full speed before turning and giving a thumbs up to his passengers, who braced themselves for liftoff. The chopper rose into the air, quickly gaining altitude while moving away from the airport. He made his way to the interstate and headed for the horde. Both Barnes and Farley moved to the front of the vehicle, looking out towards their destination. The noise inside the vehicle was loud, but even with the noise Benny heard both Barnes and Farley exclaiming at the sight of the thick sea of zombies. Tens of thousands of the rotted ghouls, packed densely on the interstate, all moving towards the checkpoint. As they grew closer, Benny began to hover, turning back to talk to the men. He had to yell, given the lack of headsets. So, how the hell you want to do this? He bellowed. Farley squinted, staring out the window as he contemplated. After a moment, he finally leaned in, waving them closer. We got four of these things, he said loudly. So I'm thinking we go back about a hundred yards and drop a couple, one on each side of the interstate. Then we can move up the line another few hundred yards and do the same thing. We don't have enough to take them all out, but if we can create some breaks in the horde, it'll give us a chance to regroup between waves. Benny nodded. Sounds good to me, brother, he replied with a thumbs up. I'll get us in position. He flew over the horde, staying about fifty feet above the writhing mass. About a hundred yards deep, he hovered, giving his passengers a wave to let them know they were ready to go. As they fiddled with the makeshift bomb, he looked down at the horde. There wasn't a speck of asphalt that he could see. It was wall-to-wall, shoulder-to-shoulder creatures. Every single one of them staring up at him, mouths open, screaming and moaning, grasping at the noise, promising them a fresh meal. Benny felt almost in a trance, transfixed on the creatures, studying them with dread gripping his chest. One was completely missing the side of its face, ear gone, cheek dangling by a thread. Another was missing an arm, jagged bones sticking out about eight inches from the shoulder. Another one, fresher than the others but still rancid, 
displayed blood-soaked clothes around a multitude of deep bite marks. His whole body shuddered, and he shook his head, tearing his eyes away to look back at the maniac duo. Barnes held on to the first bomb tightly as Farley guided it over the edge of the door, then rested it gently on the landing rail, readying it to drop. You light it, the sergeant yelled, and I'll cut it. Barnes nodded and pulled out his lighter, setting the top bit of fabric on fire. In a matter of seconds, the flames raced through the fuel-soaked rag, creating half a dozen flaming strands on the container. Farley jammed his knife into the plastic near the middle, a bit of fuel squirting out from the four-inch wide gap. Both men froze for a moment, and then let out sighs of relief when it missed the flame. The sergeant nodded to his partner and received one in return. Farley ripped the blade from the container and they immediately pushed it off the side. Fuel sprayed from the hole as it spun through the air, and about ten yards from the ground finally caught, the whole thing going up in flames. It exploded in a spectacular display of flaming liquid, coating dozens of creatures below. Benny looked out and admired the success, creatures catching fire and spreading it to other ones nearby. He glanced back at his passengers. Hang on, I got an idea, he yelled, and began to lower the helicopter once he made sure they were holding on to something. When the chopper hovered about fifteen feet above the outstretched zombie's hands, the intensity of the wind coming off of the blades fanned the flames, spreading them to more zombies, creating easily a twenty-yard radius of crispified ghouls. Hell yeah! Farley bellowed, pumping his fist into the air. Good job! Let's move on to the next drop! Benny rose again, moving over to hover at the next spot while the duo got to work on a fresh bomb. He did his best to avoid transfixing on individual zombies again, but his eyes strayed downwards, pulling him into another trance full of dread. Finally, he snapped himself out of it again, staring straight ahead down the interstate into the nearly impenetrable mass of rotted flesh. He shook his head. We're going to need a lot more bombs if this is going to work. Chapter 4 Benny landed the chopper on the airstrip. Barnes shook his hand a bit, still stinging from one of the flames that had leapt up and caught him as they pushed the final homemade bomb out the door. You gonna be okay, Bubba? Benny asked, brow furrowed. Farley rolled his eyes. Oh, he'll be fine, he drawled. It's me you have to worry about. I'm going to have to hear about how I tried to set him on fire until the end of time. Damn right you are, Barnes agreed. He patted Benny on the back before hopping out of the chopper to run off and find some ointment for his minor burn. Farley hung back, his expression sincere. We really appreciate you taking the time to help us out, he said. It's good to see civilians stepping up in our time of need. Civilian? Benny scoffed. Hell, man, I've been flying these things since Nam. Did my part back then and doing it now. The sergeant raised his chin with respect in his eyes and gave the pilot a salute. Appreciate you even more, then, he said. My pleasure, sergeant, Benny replied with a nod. Anything else I can do to help, you just let me know. Farley jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Well... We made a dent in that horde headed our way, so I'm going to get busy making a few more of those bombs, he said. So when you're done for the day, if you're bored, feel free to swing on by. We'll leave a light on for you. Consider it done, Benny agreed. You boys be safe out there. Farley smirked. Hey, where's the fun in that? He asked with a wink, and the two men bumped fists before the sergeant hopped out. Once he was clear, Benny took off and headed towards the ship. It was about eighty miles as the crow flies to the Salish Sea, to the northwest of Seattle. The deep water separated the United States and Canada, or at least it did back when the invisible lines on maps mattered. The fastest route was to fly right over downtown Seattle, which, given that Benny was running behind schedule, meant that that was the route he wanted to take. He gained altitude to make sure that the buildings wouldn't be a threat, but also gave him a better view of the region. It looked like a war zone. I mean, it is a war zone, he thought, but it didn't make it any less hard to see. 
Plumes of smoke rose in all directions. It was hard to make out details, but he could see the edges of the front lines in some spots, masses of creatures in the road, all headed in one direction. He flew over downtown, looking down at the roads and seeing them just jam-packed with ghouls, just like the interstate. There was barely a spot of the street that didn't have a zombie on it. He clamped down on his dark thoughts, because these were future problems, and there was a lot more to get done before they could face this. The rest of the flight was almost relaxing, something that was rare these days. Once he emerged from the Seattle metro area, it was nothing but undeveloped land, most of which was Olympic National Park. In the pre-apocalypse days, it had been a popular outdoor tourist destination. Now it was among the last bastions of relaxation to be found. As Benny flew over, there was a glint that peeked out from the top of a hill up ahead. He furrowed his brow, shaking his head. There weren't supposed to be any troops out there. He adjusted course and looked down, seeing a small community of people on the hill, several looking up at him and frantically waving their arms. A collection of campers were in a circle, tightly giving them a safish zone from any stragglers or wildlife that would come their way. Even at fifty yards up, Benny could see the dirt and grime on these people, but most of all, the absolute elation on their faces to see an aircraft. He knew he didn't have time to land, which made guilt twist his guts, so he looked around for a solution. There was a notebook beside his seat and he grabbed it, scribbling out a quick note. Military is here. Help will be coming. Maybe a few days, but we're here and not leaving. Hang tight. He looked around for something heavy to attach it to and finally reached for his food bag. He dug around, picking up a few MREs. He checked the labels until he found one that boasted ham and egg omelette. Yeah, that'll work, he said with a chuckle, and ripped the top off stuffing the note inside. He lowered the chopper a little, about twenty yards off of the ground, and opened his window, holding his arm out to make sure that he wouldn't be dropping it on anyone's head. He let go, and watched it hit the grass, and waited for one of the campers to run over and pick it up. A young-looking blonde woman pulled out the note, looked it over, and then gave him a thumbs up. Benny responded in kind, and then rose back up into the air, heading off towards his destination. Good to know it's not just going to be military people who survive this, he thought to himself. As soon as he reached the water's edge, Benny spotted the fleet of ships. There were dozens of them, all anchored just offshore. Several smaller boats shuttled men and material to the shore, taking control of some of the smaller waterfront tourist towns. He headed out to his target ship, which was right at the head of the line. As he approached, he was waved in by someone on deck. After a successful landing on the helipad, he powered down and hopped out. The deck crew descended immediately. Several people appeared carrying boxes, another with a fuel line, and mechanics swarmed the craft to check the engine. Before Benny could even take three steps, a soldier appeared at his side. Sir, Captain McCall would like to have a word with you, he said. Benny nodded. Yeah, that's not a surprise, he replied. He's in the ready room just inside that door. The soldier explained, pointing at a nondescript door a few feet away. Appreciate it, Benny said, tipping an invisible hat to the young man. He headed towards the door on deck, entering it and taking an immediate right to the ready room. It looked like it could hold about twenty people, and was covered wall to wall with maps. There were a few people on the outer edges of the room studying the pages and drawing on them, but Benny focused on the far end desk. Captain McCall stood next to it, surrounded by several soldiers, but he waved them off when he noticed Benny approaching. You all know what to do, he said brusquely. Now get to it. Yes, sir, the soldiers murmured, and split off in various directions. Benny, so good of you to join us, McCall said, beginning to wonder if you had just said to hell with it and found you an island retreat somewhere. The pilot smirked. And miss all this fun? He waved a hand around. Wouldn't dream of it. Look, I know you are ex-military and have been a civilian for decades now, the captain said icily, but there's no excuse for being nearly an hour late to pick up supplies. I expect better of the people under me, 
and you're no exception, so you need to shape up. Benny ran his tongue over his teeth and cocked his head. You know, Captain, a month ago, this would be where I would tell you to fuck off, he replied, emphasizing the last two words with such venom a few of the soldiers stopped what they were doing to gape at him. However, I know you are under a lot of stress, especially considering we're down several transports at the moment. As a result, I'm going to let your condescending tone slide, and let you get back to telling me what I need to do. There was a moment of tense silence, and then the captain opened his mouth to respond, but Benny leaned forward, narrowing his eyes. Oh, and just in case you thought I was taking a break to jerk myself off while daydreaming about your wife, he continued. I was risking my ass helping those boys down at the Renton airport, who are about to be overrun by a whole fuckload of those things. Hell, the only time I wasn't actively helping kill those things was when I was flying out here, taking a moment to drop a note to some survivors in the hills who are going to need some help here once we get this shit show under control. He broke away from the desk and walked right over to a map of the area, snatching a marker from a stunned soldier's hand. That's about where I saw them he said as he circled an area on the paper before handing back the marker. They're on top of a giant ass hill, so you can't miss them. Oh, okay, the soldier stammered, taking the marker back. The annoyed pilot stalked back over to the desk. Now, I believe you were about to tell me what suicide run you need me to go on next. The room was deathly silent for a few moments and the captain opened and closed his mouth a few times before finally making noise. I... he stammered, clearly unsure of how to handle Benny's outburst. Um... he cleared his throat. We're loading you up with some ammo and MREs. We're starting to run low on both, but we have an urgent need on our northern flank. Almost due east of here is a town on a river called Burlington. Benny nodded. Heard some stories about Burlington from some of the people back at the airport to the east, he replied. Sounds like those boys had a rough go of it. They did, McCall agreed, nodding. And they've been in the shit since day one. We just reinforced them yesterday with five hundred more troops, but they need supplies in order to push ahead further. He paused, motioning to a page on his desk. Satellite imagery shows a decent-sized horde headed their way and they need to prepare, since those five hundred-some-odd men are the only thing standing between our northern force and a full-on second front war. The pilot nodded. I'll get the stuff up there and hurry back. Your contact on the ground is a... The captain began, shuffling through a few papers until he found the one he needed. Sergeant Copeland. He's arranged a landing zone for you at the super center just south of the bridge. Benny nodded again. I'll be back then he said, and turned away. One more thing, McCall said, holding up a hand. Yeah? the pilot asked. We need you back as quickly as possible, because there are more runs to make, the captain said, and drummed his fingers on the desk for a beat. That said, if the sergeant needs something you can provide, take some time and help him out. Benny nodded and walked out of the room cracking a sly smile to himself outside at the verbal smackdown he'd delivered to the pompous captain. Chapter 5 Benny took off from the ship deck and glided over the open water. The sun was high enough in the eastern sky that it wasn't completely blinding him as he flew east. The glimmer of light on the water was scenic and beautiful, a welcome reprieve from the horror he'd come from in the city and what he was about to fly into. Okay, due east until I hit the interstate, then head north, he thought. Shouldn't be too difficult. About ten minutes into the flight, he reached land, and immediately spotted signs of war. Several small groups of soldiers walked along the streets, clearing out stragglers while others secured buildings. They must be desperate for ammo if they're already clearing out stores while the front lines are still fighting, he thought. Just how fucked are we? The thought made his stomach drop a bit, but he shook off the cloud of negativity threatening his mind and quickly located the interstate so he could make the turn north. The highway was covered in bodies, no doubt from a march north by the reinforcements. He glanced to the side streets as he flew, but didn't see any movement. 
At least they have this shit on lockdown up here, he thought. Gotta be getting close. A few more minutes of flying and he spotted the bridge. There was a small army of soldiers on it, and in the street before it, but the details of the bridge were still too far out to see. He scanned the area and found the supercenter, finding his landing spot and gently setting the chopper down. As the blade slowed, a large dark-skinned soldier walked up to him, and Benny's eyes lit up, recognizing the burly sergeant from Spokane. "'I thought that name sounded familiar,' he exclaimed as he jumped down from the chopper. "'How the hell are you, soldier?' "'Benny, my man,' Copeland replied, holding out his hand. "'What are you doing up in these parts?' The pilot shook excitedly, a goofy smile widening as he enjoyed reuniting with a familiar face. "'Well, they told me you boys didn't know how to ration properly,' he teased. "'So they needed me to bring you some MREs and ammo.' "'Is that what Captain McCall told you?' Copeland replied, rolling his eyes. Benny wrinkled his nose. "'So, you're familiar with that uptight asswipe?' "'Our paths have crossed,' the sergeant replied with a chuckle. "'Well, boy, have I got a story for you,' the pilot declared. "'Come on, and give me the tour, and I'll tell you while we walk.' Copeland nodded and let out a loud whistle. Several soldiers broke away from a nearby store and rushed over. "'I'm going to take my friend here up to the bridge,' the sergeant explained. "'You men get this unloaded and sorted.' There was a chorus of, "'Yes, sir,' and Copeland put his arm around Benny's shoulders and led him towards the bridge. "'So, about that story,' the sergeant said, with the tone of a schoolgirl excited for gossip. A few minutes later, the two men reached the bridge, walking around ammo reserves and men prepping spikes out of tree branches and broom handles. You didn't, Copeland exclaimed, letting out a deep belly laugh. Benny grinned. I most certainly did. Oh, man, the sergeant said, wiping imaginary tears from his eyes. I can't wait to be a civilian so I can tell him to fuck off. Well... If you want me to deliver a message, Benny replied, waggling his eyebrows, all you gotta do is ask. Copeland laughed again, shaking his head. Good to know. They reached the concrete barricade, which was manned by four armed guards. The pilot took a deep breath and let out a low whistle when he looked beyond it. That is a special level of fucked up there, Sergeant, he said. Copeland crossed his arms. The military trains us to improvise with what we have at our disposal, he replied with a shrug, and that's exactly what we're doing. Beyond the concrete barricade was a maze of corpses. Each wall was ten to fifteen yards wide and stacked three to four bodies high. It ran the entire length of the bridge, with about twenty in total. Come on, I'll give you a closer look, Copeland said, waving for his friend to follow him. They hopped the concrete and walked out to the rotted maze. A few soldiers were working on the one closest to them. One man lifted two bodies stacked on top of each other, while another one jammed the dull end of a five-foot-long stake into the two below. He used enough force to shove it through the first body and partially into the second one, giving it a good wiggle to make sure it was secure. He nodded to his partner, who lowered the other corpses back down, creating a sturdy trap. This wall had about a dozen spikes sticking out of it. How are we looking, soldier? Copeland asked. Sir, we have another couple of spikes to put on this barricade, and one more over there that needs some, one of the soldiers replied. After that, we'll have the preliminary trap set. Once the boys in the back finish with their whittling, we'll add one more. Copeland nodded. Good work, he said. Keep it up. The two soldiers made noises in the affirmative and got back to work. The sergeant led Benny to the center of the road and turned to look down it. Between you and me, the pilot asked quietly, how well do you think these are going to hold up? Copeland shook his head. If some stragglers wander in, they'll work great, he replied. If we get some of the horde they say is coming our way, then it might buy us some time. Minutes, but they'll be valuable. Plus, keeping the men busy with stuff like this keeps them out of their own heads, which is key when they're facing what we're facing. 
If it's anything like what they're facing down south, Benny said dryly, you're going to need more wooden spikes. The sergeant shrugged. Based on what you brought us, it doesn't seem like we're high up on the priority list. So we're doing what we can. Which reminds me. He pulled out his radio and began fiddling with the knob. Send a couple of my boys up to this little town to the northeast called Cedro Woolley. It's a few miles off the interstate, but we're hoping we can pull some of the horde that way when they start getting close. Divide and conquer, Benny agreed. Hard to argue with the classic. Go ahead and do what you gotta do. Copeland gave him a thumbs up as he raised the radio to his mouth. Kowalski, it's Copeland, he said. Do you copy? There were a few moments of silence and his brow furrowed. Kowalski, it's Copeland, he said more forcefully this time. Can you stop slacking off and grab the radio? A moment later, the line opened, gunfire peppering the background. Having a hell of a day over here, Sarge, Kowalski said. Copeland sighed and shook his head. What have you gotten yourselves into now? Well, we were scouting like you said, the sniper replied. And one thing led to another, and now we're surrounded by a few hundred of these fuckers. The sergeant took a deep breath. Can you get out? he asked. Of course we can, Kowalski scoffed. Unless you mean get out alive, in which case there's zero chance. But we can certainly run out of zombies, no problem. Copeland put the radio to his forehead for a moment, closing his eyes. Damn it, he muttered, and then brought the walkie-talkie back to his lips. Okay, where are you? Northeast corner of town, a few blocks up from a baseball field, Kowalski replied. We're in a house. Several rapid-fire shots and some yelling cut him off. Oh shit, Wade needs me, the sniper blurted. Just get to the attic and hang tight, Copeland replied quickly. Help is on the way. He turned to Benny. You got time to give a friend a lift? He asked. The pilot nodded. Whatever you need, I'm game. Johnson, you copy? The sergeant asked. What do you need, Sarge? Came the reply. Meet me at the supercenter, Copeland instructed. Helicopter in the parking lot. We got an urgent errand to run. Johnson grunted through the radio. Oh, Lord, what did Kowalski do now? The sergeant chuckled. His usual stuff, he replied. Double time it, because they're on the clock. On the way, Johnson assured him. Copeland pocketed the radio and turned to Benny. Sorry to cut the tour short, he said. You can just give me the aerial tour then, the pilot replied, clapping him on the shoulder. The sergeant nodded as they headed back for the barricade. Sounds good to me. Chapter 6 Benny piloted the helicopter of the town of Burlington towards Cedro Woolley, which was just a few miles away. As he rose high into the air, Copeland pointed out some barricades they'd built in the city. There were cars at almost every intersection, creating pockets where troops could station themselves to fight off the dead. If we can break up that horde enough, those pockets can hold them off, he explained. At least for a while. Benny eyed the roads. Looks like you got every car in town down there. Just about, Copeland replied with a nod. We started moving some up the interstate a bit to slow him down, but like everything else, it's a stopgap measure. The pilot shook his head with a sigh. It's a shame we can't just napalm them, he said. You and me both, brother, the sergeant replied. You and me both. They flew out of town, almost immediately spotting Cedro Woolley up ahead. Can you do a flyover so we can see where they're at? Copeland asked. Benny nodded and rose up to get a better view. Johnson leaned forward from behind them to look out through the front. The pilot quickly spotted the baseball field and headed that way, and just a few blocks north of that was a house with hundreds of zombies surrounding it. Any chance you can get low enough that they can hop on from the roof? Copeland asked. Benny shook his head. Too many power lines and trees, he explained. I'd rather not crash this thing if I can help it. Not gonna argue with that, the sergeant agreed. Can you drop us off at the baseball field? Benny nodded. Heading there now, he replied, and swooped in the direction of the baseball field. He lowered down on the infield, noting a few zombies on the other side of the fences, agitated by the noise. 
Won't be long, Copeland assured him. Benny nodded. I'm on channel 22, he said as he checked his radio. I'm going to park this thing on the roof of that warehouse a few blocks over. I'll be ready to pick you boys up whenever you're good to go. The sergeant nodded, and they exchanged a fist bump before the two soldiers leapt out. Once they were clear, Benny took off and headed for his landing spot. So, what's the plan, Sarge? Johnson asked. Copeland shook his head. No clue, he admitted. Let's just get up there and see what we can see. The duo walked towards the fence. A few zombies pressed up against it, wiggling their rotted fingers as they reached over the waist-high chain link. The soldiers didn't break stride as they pulled out their knives and approached them. Are we keeping a tally on how many times Kowalski gets into these sorts of situations? Johnson asked as he lashed out, stabbing one of the ghouls in the forehead. Because if I were a betting man, I'd say that by the end of all this, he's going to get some sort of record. Copeland stabbed one through the eye and shrugged. I mean, if you want to keep track, don't let me stop you, he replied. Just put me down for twenty bucks on Kowalski getting stuck ten times before anybody else reaches five. I can work with that, Johnson agreed as he dispatched a burly zombie in the face. Gonna have to give some high odds to sucker in some of the people who don't know him like we do. The sergeant chuckled. Do what you gotta do, he said. Just don't take money from anybody above my head. Not sure I want to explain that or why I keep sending Kowalski on missions like this. What about Kersey? Johnson asked. A twinkle in his eye as he snapped a ghoul's neck. Copeland stabbed the final zombie in the temple and paused. He's a busy man, he replied slowly. But I'll throw in twenty on his behalf. I know he's good for it. And he might get on me for not going with a sure thing. They chuckled as they hopped the fence, casually stepping over the corpses they just dropped. They picked up the pace, beginning a light jog to the north. The streets were clear, except for the occasional body in the road. Guess Kowalski and Wade pulled everything their way, Johnson mused. Copeland nodded. Let's just hope there weren't too many of them, he replied. They moved off of the road and started working their way through the yards, heading up the last few blocks and trying to stay out of sight. Eventually they spotted zombies a couple of blocks up and moved cautiously, crouching. When they reached the house across the street from their friends, they looked out at the zombies easily forty bodies deep from the house. They took cover behind the back corner to weigh their options. Johnson shook his head. Fucking Kowalski, he muttered. Never ceases to amaze me what that boy can get into. Come on, let's get inside and figure something out, Copeland said, and led the way to the back door. He tried the handle quietly, but it was locked. Johnson smashed the window and reached in to unlock the deadbolt, opening the door and motioning for the sergeant to enter with a flourish. They secured the door and did a quick sweep of the house, finding it blissfully empty. They moved to the sitting room at the front of the house, peering out the big bay window overlooking the street. The yard across from them was packed thick with ghouls, covering the entire grassy area and stretching back to the road. Looking closer, the front door appeared to be bowing under the pressure. That door isn't going to hold much longer, Copeland muttered, and pulled out his radio, raising it to his lips. Kowalski, we're in position, he said. Where are you two? We're up in the attic like you suggested, the sniper replied immediately. We've punched a hole through the shingles, but haven't gone outside. The sergeant took a deep breath. Either of you hurt? Just our pride, Sarge, Kowalski replied, melancholy in his voice. Copeland rolled his eyes. Good, because you boys are going to have to haul ass in a minute. What's the plan? The sniper asked. The sergeant squinted at the horde through the window. We're going to figure out a way to pull them away from the house, he explained. Then you two are going to get to the chopper back at the baseball field. What about you? Kowalski asked. Johnson and I will be all right, Copeland assured him. We haven't killed anything today, so it'll help us hit our quota. You just be ready to move when we get the path clear. We'll be ready, the sniper replied firmly. Copeland lowered the radio and looked at his companion. All right, he said. What's your big idea to draw their attention? Me? Johnson gaped. When did that chore fall to me? The sergeant burst out laughing. Don't worry, I got an idea, he said, raising a hand. 
I'm going to head out there and pop off a few rounds and lead as many of them away as I can. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Just going to run them around the block. Once I've pulled them away, you're going to get out there and get on cleanup duty so those two knuckleheads can get out. I'll meet you three at the airfield soon after. Yeah, I can dig that plan, Johnson replied, nodding. Copeland raised an eyebrow. What? You aren't going to be all noble and volunteer for the dangerous part? Shit, Sarge, you've seen me run, his companion said sheepishly. If I wanted to commit suicide, there are easier ways. The sergeant chuckled and patted Johnson on the shoulder. Don't worry, man, I wouldn't do that to you, he assured him. Now get ready to move. I'll let Benny know what the deal is. The private nodded and readied his weapon as Copeland headed to the back of the house and slipped outside. He walked down a few houses to give himself a buffer, and then crouched, pulling out his walkie-talkie. "'Hey, Benny, you copy?' he asked into the receiver. "'Haven't heard anything explode yet,' the pilot drawled. "'So going to go out on a limb and guess you haven't got your boys yet?' Copeland chuckled. "'Not yet, but we're about to,' he said. "'Going to need you to dust off in ten and head back to the baseball field to pick up three. Three? Benny asked. "'Sounds like we're missing one.' The sergeant took a deep breath. "'Only temporarily,' he replied. "'I'm the rabbit in this hunt, so I'm going to be late to the party and coming in hot. You just don't leave without me.' "'Wouldn't dream of it,' the pilot promised. "'And I'll be there to pick up your squad. You be safe.' Copeland nodded. Appreciate it, he said. See you in a few. He shoved the radio back into his pocket and walked out to the road, three houses down from the horde. He looked around, checking all the nooks and crannies nearby, but didn't spot any ghouls hanging out. They all seemed to be trying to get at Kowalski and Wade with their friends. He checked his rifle before aiming it towards the horde. He picked a target and began firing hitting several zombie heads in quick succession. The shot echoed throughout the empty neighborhood, drawing the attention of the ghouls. Slowly but surely they crept away from the house, shambling in his direction. About half of the creatures in the yard came after him, so he fired a few more shots to try to draw the rest out. When the closest zombie came within ten yards of him, Copeland turned and started walking, pausing occasionally to shoot another ghoul to make sure they kept following him like the Pied Piper. Johnson watched as the sergeant led the bulk of them away, dismayed that there were still a dozen or so stragglers in the yard. Damn loafers, he muttered under his breath. He got up in a huff and strode out the front door, readying his knife. When he reached the road and looked, he spotted the back end of the horde a full block away. He contemplated using his gun, but then shook his head. Only if I start getting overwhelmed, he thought. He walked up to the first zombie at the far end of the house and jammed his blade into the back of its skull. He whipped around and took on the next two, stabbing them in the face in quick succession. By the time their bodies hit the ground, the other nine had taken an interest in the noise and worked their way towards him. Fuck it, I'm too old for this shit, Johnson declared, and raised his rifle. He quickly executed the rest of the creatures, one by one dropping them expertly. When the front yard was nothing but unmoving corpses, he strode up to the front door and rang the doorbell. Several moments passed before Kowalski opened the door, weighed beside him. Two men shacking up together is sinful, Johnson bellowed in his best preacher voice. You two motherfuckers need Jesus. The gore-covered duo stared at him, slowly shaking their heads at his antics. You done, Johnson? Wade asked, voice tired. The private in question hooked a thumb into the top of his pants and shot them a lazy grin. Depends. Have you two repented? Hell no. Never will. Satan rules, Kowalski replied quickly. Now can we get the fuck out of here already? Johnson sighed as if it were the worst thing in the world that they didn't find him funny. Okay, fine, he said. Come on, we got a chopper waiting. Wait, what about Copeland? Wade asked holding up a hand. He says he'll catch up, Johnson replied with a shrug. Kowalski nodded and brushed past him on the front step. Good enough for me, he said. Let's move. 
Chapter 7 Copeland led the horde down the street, having reached four blocks away from the house. He'd stopped firing at that point, as any breakaways this far away wouldn't be a threat. I know Johnson is slow, he thought with amusement, but that should be enough time, even for him. He pulled out his walkie-talkie and raised it to his mouth. Benny, you pick up the boys yet? he asked. Yeah, we're hanging out on second base waiting for you, the pilot replied. Where you at? Copeland glanced over his shoulder again. About four blocks east of where Kowalski was, he said. I'm getting ready to make the turn and head back. Copy that. We'll be waiting, Benny assured him. The sergeant picked up the pace a bit, leaving the zombies behind and reaching the next intersection. Just gotta make the turn, then double back, and... He stopped short in the middle of the road at the sight of a small army of zombies. There were several dozen of them, and they turned towards him, roomy eyes excited as they shambled towards a fresh meal. Damn, Copeland muttered under his breath. Looks like I'm going up another block. He broke into a moderate sprint, heading up towards the next intersection, and more ghouls began to emerge from side streets, attracted to his fan club's moaning. He stopped in the middle of the road, looking around frantically for a solution. He pulled out the radio and quickly raised it to his lips. Benny, I'm in the shit, he blurted. Need some help. What do you need? the pilot asked immediately. Copeland scratched the back of his head. Not going to be able to double back, he explained. So just going to have to go north. Going to need a pickup, but I have no clue where. Just start heading north, Benny suggested. We'll be able to find out. Ten four, the sergeant replied and stuffed the walkie-talkie back into his pocket. He moved north into a yard next to him, and a few ghouls staggered out from the backyard. Copeland didn't waste any time, raising his rifle and firing two quick shots in succession to drop them without breaking stride. He rushed through the yard and hopped the fence into the next one, only to be greeted by a couple dozen zombies pouring in from between the houses. He knew the gunfire hadn't done him any favors on that front, and contemplated whether he should continue. But in any case, the pack was too dense. He looked around and focused in on the back patio door, firing a few shots to shatter the glass. He rushed over, barely beating the ghouls to the door, their hands grasping at air as he passed. He practically flew through the house, catching a glimpse of a corpse out of the corner of his eye down the hallway. But there was no time to pause, so he threw open the front door, there were a few stragglers in the front yard, and he dodged them, giving one a shove on the way by to send it tumbling to the ground. When he reached the street, he looked back to see that there weren't any ghouls in his immediate vicinity, and took a quick breather to plot his path. He moved into the next yard and then heard the relieving sound of a chopper overhead. Copeland darted into the center of the grass in an open space and waved his hands frantically in the air. Benny hovered above and Kowalski opened the door, motioning for the sergeant to keep moving. He gave the sniper a thumbs up and then continued his run, tearing down a couple more blocks while dodging the few zombies shambling around. Soon he reached a large field where Benny had set the chopper down in the center. Copeland hopped a fence and jogged up to the helicopter as Kowalski threw open the door. Damn, Sarge, you had us worried there for a minute, he gushed. The sergeant shook his head waving his hands back and forth in front of his face. Oh no, we aren't doing that now, he declared. The day you start worrying about me is the day I submit my resignation. The group laughed as he climbed aboard and he reached into the front to pat Benny on the shoulder. I appreciate you pulling my chestnuts out of the fire there, bud, Copeland said with a smile. The pilot raised an eyebrow. Well, I still have to give McCall your <clears throat> message he replied. Wouldn't have quite the impact if you weren't alive. The sergeant laughed as the engine revved up and the chopper lifted off, headed back to Burlington before Benny's next mission. Chapter 8 Benny flew back towards the south end of town, towards Mercer Island. The chopper had been refueled and restocked on the ship, off to deliver vital goods to the main diversion team. 
After coming over the downtown area, he approached the water's edge, seeing tens of thousands of ghouls within a half mile of the shore, attracted to the noise on the island. Whatever those boys are doing, it's working like a charm, he murmured. He flew out over the water and spotted muzzle flashes coming from the shoreline, spread out about every ten yards or so. He looked around, finally finding the shopping district to the north, which was his landing zone. As he flew over the stores, he spotted a bright orange circle painted onto one of the parking lots, with several people standing around beside various pickup trucks. Guess that's my stop, he mused, and lowered his altitude. He landed the chopper and powered it down, sliding out of his seat and jumping down to the ground. As soon as his boots hit the pavement, a small army of soldiers rushed up to begin unloading. Benny nodded in approval at their efficiency. You must be the new pilot, a sergeant said as he approached with a corporal in tow. Benny nodded, offering his hand. Yeah, a couple of other boys are out of action for the time being, he said. So I'm picking up their slack. I'm Benny. It's appreciated, the sergeant said as they shook. I'm Sergeant Kipling, and this here is Corporal Herrera. Herrera gave a curt nod as they shook hands as well. We're burning through ammo quick, keeping those things across the way tied up. Looks like you're doing a good job, though, Benny replied, motioning to the water, because there are thousands of those things lined up wanting a piece of what you're serving up. Kipling sighed. Hope it's more than just thousands, he said. We really need to be in the tens or even low hundreds for this to be worthwhile. I mean, if you want to go check for yourself, Benny offered jerking a thumb over his shoulder. I can give you a lift. The sergeant shook his head, waving a hand. Nah, it's all good, he replied. Not really anything we can change at this point. How much longer do you think you're going to be on distraction duty? The pilot asked. Herrera shrugged. No telling, he admitted. Our troops are making a big push from the east, some of them even getting to the shoreline already. Speaking of which... Kipling cut in, raising a finger. We do have another issue that could use your attention. Benny nodded. What do you need? Why don't you come inside here and I'll fill you in? The sergeant asked, and waved for him to follow. The trio headed for a small Chinese restaurant in a strip mall. As they entered the building, Benny appraised several troops grabbing a bite, with a few soldiers in the back working the grill. You hungry? Kipling asked. Can we get you something? The pilot took a deep whiff, groaning at the scent of sizzling meat. As long as it's not an MRE, he said, I'll take whatever you got. Kipling let out a sharp whistle, gaining the attention of the grill chefs. Combo plate, right here, he called. The soldiers immediately sprung to action, pulling food off of the grill and putting it on a plate. One of them grabbed it and rushed it over, setting it on the table in front of Benny as they took a seat. The pilot gaped at the fresh food in front of him, mouth watering at the sight and smell. One combo plate, the chef declared. Everything is out of a can, but I have a few tricks up my sleeve. Hope you enjoy. Benny grinned up at him. Looks great, he said sincerely. I appreciate it. He picked up his fork and dug in, moaning at the taste of hot spiced food. Kipling pulled out a crudely drawn map of the island and surrounding areas, pointing to different spots on the map as he spoke. Okay, we're here, he said. To the south of us is Renton, where our boys have pushed forward and set up shop. Yep, I was down there earlier today, Benny replied through a mouthful of meat. They got their hands full, that's for sure. The sergeant nodded. I don't doubt it, he replied. To the east, south of the I-90. Some of the main force has reached the shore. However, there has been some heavy resistance in spots, so a significant portion of them are still half a mile back or so. North of the I-90 is a completely different story. There are some densely populated areas in and around Bellevue, Herrera added, leaning forward on his elbows, which has really slowed things up. However, they've been pulling a lot of zombies from the downtown area their way, and it's straining the barricade on the bridge. Kipling tapped on the area in question. At the start of this, they blocked off the bridge with some trucks and it worked okay for a while, he continued. 
but the weight of twenty thousand zombies pushing against it is starting to create an opening. The higher-ups are afraid that if it gets any larger, it could pose a threat to the advancement. So they've authorized a strafing run with the Apaches to thin out the herd. Benny swallowed his mouthful and smacked his lips. So, what can I do? We have three men trapped on the top of those trucks, and they need an evac, Herrera replied. If we can't get them off soon, they're going to be forced to take a dive into the water. Kipling pursed his lips. Which isn't an ideal situation, especially given that one of them is injured, he explained. We've been ordered to arrange pickup for them, which in their mind means a water rescue. But if you're ballsy enough to land that thing of yours on a transport truck, I think it would have a better outcome for all involved. Benny shoved another huge bite into his mouth, chuckling through the meat. Normally, it's a good strategy to call out the ballsiness of the troops to get them to endanger their lives, he said as he swallowed. What you didn't account for is that I'm a civilian. He pointed his fork at them and then back at himself. The two soldiers nodded slowly, sharing a nervous glance. Lucky for you, the pilot continued. I'm a crazy motherfucker, so I'll do it just for the challenge. He let out a big belly laugh and the soldiers joined in, shaking their heads. Kipling leaned forward. I really can't thank you enough. Thank me after I pull it off. Benny replied, shoving another forkful into his mouth. I'll do that, the sergeant promised. Now you take your time and finish your meal. Herrera here is going to ride along to help you out. He'll be waiting for you at the chopper. The pilot nodded. Good deal, sergeant, he replied. I'll have your boys safely back home in no time. The soldiers smiled and got up vacating the table to leave him to finish his meal in peace. As they disappeared out the door, Benny chuckled to himself and shook his head. Didn't know this was on my bucket list, he thought. But it sure as hell is now. Chapter 9 Benny fired up the chopper, looking back to make sure Herrera was nice and situated in the back. After a moment, the corporal gave him a thumbs up and Benny returned it before taking off, quickly gaining altitude and heading to the north. As they reached the top of the island, the pilot looked to the west, seeing the bridge in that direction was jam-packed with zombies. There were a dozen or so men on the trucks there, giving a constant stream of fire to keep the horde at bay. From what he could tell, there was a good twenty yards of corpses on the bridge next to the truck. The flight over the water was short, the target bridge quickly appearing on the horizon. Herrera moved up to the front of the helicopter, kneeling beside Benny. He tapped him on the shoulder and pointed to the east, where a large group of soldiers had managed to push through to the shoreline, setting up an encampment and gunner positions. As they made it further up the coast, they could see why, as throngs of zombies had pushed to the shore and worked their way towards them. Benny and Herrera shared a look, silently hoping that those boys knew what they were doing. The chopper rose up, a couple hundred yards above the bridge, so the duo could get a proper lay of the land. And it was brutal. To the east, hundreds of zombies spread out on the bridge in the sea, most of which headed towards the noise of the invading force. To the west was something straight out of a nightmare. Tens of thousands of zombies pressed tightly together, surged forwards to try to maneuver past the barricade. The truck started to shift, the gap between them now eight feet wide. The trickle became a steady stream. As they grew closer, Benny spotted three men standing up on the back of the truck, waving at them. Get them to move back so I got room to work, the pilot instructed. Not entirely sure exactly how this is going to happen. Herrera gave him a thumbs up and headed for the door as the chopper turned sideways so that he faced the troops. He waved to get their attention and then made an exaggerated motion for them to move back way back. They got the hint and clambered to the far end of the truck, near the centre of the road. They were cautious, making sure they kept their footing on the truck that shifted back and forth due to the raging zombie river below. Once they were clear, Benny inched the helicopter towards the truck, making sure to stay several feet above the top. It was a little touch and go as the wind coming off the water made it difficult to hold it steady. 
After a few failed attempts, he shook his head. He motioned for Herrera to come up to him, and then said, Landing ain't gonna happen, but I can hover just above it and they can hop in. He held up a closed fist. When I give you the signal, you get them over here quick. You got it, the corporal replied, and got into position, ready to go. Benny positioned the chopper over the truck, getting it as low as he possibly could. He managed to stabilize it about three feet from the top, and then raised his fists to give the signal. Herrera waved frantically for the men to start coming, and the soldiers moved as quickly as they could across the truck. The injured private brought up the rear, and Herrera pulled him inside and slammed the door shut. Benny lifted off, rising high and away from the flood of ghouls below, and then hovered for a moment, turning his head. Everybody good? he bellowed. When he received an emphatic thumbs up from each of his passengers, the pilot smiled and faced front again, heading back for the parking lot. He touched down and powered off the engine, jumping out to help the boys. He peered in and saw that one of the privates was looking woozy. Yo, he barked to one of the soldiers behind him. Let's get a medic over here. Appreciate it, Private Hess said, but we're good. The injured soldier, Private Baker, offered a weak smile. Not the first time we've been dinged up. I said get a goddamn medic over here, Benny demanded, and the man he'd been yelling at ran off. Again, Hess said, raising a hand. Appreciate the concern, but we're good. The pilot wagged a finger at them. You know, I had a guy back in Nam tell me the same thing, he said firmly. I had just flown into a hot spot, taking fire on every side just to get his ass out of there. Got back to base and he said he was fine and didn't need a medic, even though he was bleeding from the head. He leaned in, brow furrowed. And do you know what happened to him? Um, Baker replied slowly. Did he die? Benny shook his head. Hell no, he didn't die. But you know what he did when he got back to the States? He asked. He got into politics. He threw up his hands. So obviously there was some sort of brain damage done. Now do you want that to be you, or do you want the doc here to make sure you didn't break that marble inside your skull? The three privates exchanged awkward glances, not sure how to respond, but finally nodded at the brusque pilot. Yeah, a doc sounds good, the injured soldier agreed. Good, that's what I thought, Benny huffed, and backed up as the medic reached the chopper and climbed inside. Herrera stepped up to him shaking his head. You're one hell of a pilot, he said. Just doing what I can, Benny replied. Well, after that speech, you should consider going into politics yourself, the corporal teased. That was quite persuasive. The pilot clucked his tongue. I'd rather stick my junk through a glory hole knowing there were zombies on the other side than be a politician, he declared. Herrera burst out laughing. What? I'm serious, Benny replied, deadpan. At least I'd still have my soul. The corporal clapped him on the shoulder. That you would, buddy, he said. That you would. As they waited for the medic to check out the soldiers, Kipling approached and offered the duo a smile. Good job getting those guys out of trouble, he said. Benny shrugged. Just another day at the office, he quipped. Well, your day isn't over yet, the sergeant continued. Just got a call from Captain McCall. He wants you back at the ship pronto. Something's going down, but he didn't say what. The pilot sighed. That's always a good sign, he muttered. Tell him I'm on the way. He watched the rescued privates make their way down from the helicopter and crossed his arms. Good God, what now? Chapter 10 Benny landed on deck and hopped out, immediately making a beeline for the ready room. A soldier stepped into his path and opened his mouth, but the pilot held up a hand. Yeah, yeah, I know where he is, Benny said, waving him off. Just get my baby loaded up, will ya? The soldier blinked at him for a moment, but then stepped out of the way and joined the others loading up gear and refueling. Benny strolled into the ready room, the same vibe in the room of people still working on maps at the edges. What you got for me now, Captain? The pilot asked as he approached the desk. McCall didn't look up from his papers, only whistling loudly, and within seconds, 
a soldier rushed over with a map, slamming it down on the table. Benny's brow furrowed as he watched the frantic movements of the soldier pointing things out to the captain. McCall, what's going on? he asked. The captain muttered something to the soldier, and once he was gone, he finally looked up at the pilot. An hour ago, two thousand troops on the northern front got cut off from the main force. He spun the map around and pointed to an area to the northwest of the I-5 bridge that Corporal Bretz had partially blocked off earlier in the week. This little area is known as Roosevelt, just a mile or so north of the I-5 bridge. It's a huge residential area with some significant shopping areas west of the interstate. The noise the main northern force is creating has riled up the zombies to the south, and they've been pouring over in droves. So we went to this group pushing to the south in an attempt to shore up defences. He took a deep breath. They went a little too hard because they are now surrounded. Let me guess, Benny drawled. They're out of supplies and need more. McCall nodded. Yeah, and I'm afraid if they don't get it, we could lose everyone, he replied. You're going to be landing in a hot zone, so I need to know if you're capable of doing that. The pilot glared at him, ice in his gaze. Bitch, I was landing in hot zones when your mama was still turning tricks in the gas and gal parking lot to buy your baby formula, he growled. The audacity to ask me if I'm capable of doing that. The fuck is wrong with you? The captain held up his hands in surrender, palms out. Okay, I'm sorry, nothing like that will ever come out of my mouth again, he promised. Now we're getting you loaded up. Do you need anything? Yeah, I could use a sidearm, Benny replied. Not that comfortable with anything bigger than that, but I'd like something to defend myself. McCall nodded approvingly and unbuckled his holster, removing his personal handgun and sliding it across the desk. Benny blinked at the gesture and nodded in respect. Just so we're clear, the captain continued, pointing a finger at him. That's a loner. Just want to show that I have confidence that you're coming back. The pilot picked up the gun and inspected it before buckling the holster around his waist. I'll treat her like she was my own. Thank you, McCall replied, and then pressed his palms against the desk. Now if you want to coordinate with the private over there, he'll get you set up with exactly where you need to go. Benny nodded and headed over to the soldier in question, who stood reading reports and drawing on a satellite image of the area tacked to the wall. So, where am I going? the pilot asked, putting his hands on his hips. Okay, the private began turning to him. The troops have been able to set up a perimeter a couple blocks out from the football field here. This is going to be your landing zone. He pointed to a spot on the map. Ideally, we're going to need to do a couple of runs, so touch down. No pun intended. Benny raised an eyebrow in incredulity at the joke, and the soldier blushed crimson, shaking his head. Sorry, he blurted, and cleared his throat. Anyway, touchdown. They'll unload as quickly as they can. Then get back here as fast as you can. Worst case scenario, the supplies we're sending can sustain them until reinforcements arrive. But the more they have, the better. Understandable, Benny replied. However... Finding a football field in that area is going to be a bitch and a half. You got any other landmarks for me? The private nodded. Yes, sir, he said, pointing to the map again. There's a sizable lake a few blocks due west of the interstate. Find that, then fly east, and you can't miss the field. That'll work, the pilot replied. I'll be back, and you'll just better be ready for me. He gave the soldier a nod and then headed out of the room, walking with grizzled determination towards another shit show. Chapter 11 Benny piloted the chopper over the northern part of the city, scanning the horizon for the lake. The area below him was densely populated, packed full of homes and shopping centres, it was just the kind of place that the pilot would have considered nightmarish before the apocalypse, but doubly so now that the streets were packed with flesh-eating ghouls. He looked to the north, spotting several of the roads populated with troops, most of which were slowly moving to the south. It was still a ways to go before they reached the water separating the northern area from the downtown part of Seattle. A couple minutes of flight time later, he finally spotted a moderately sized body of water no doubt home to some of the pricier real estate in the area. Okay, found the lake, just a little further to the football field, 
he murmured. Now where are you? Benny scanned the horizon east of the interstate, rising higher into the air to get a wider view. Finally, he laid eyes on it, right where the private had said it would be. Bingo, he cheered. Let's go. He moved forward, the consistent pop of gunfire coming from below, even over the whizzing of the chopper blades. Below him was all-out warfare. Thousands of zombies descended on a four-block radius around the football field, slowly moving towards a wall of muzzle flashes. Keep holding them off, boys. I got your ammo right here. Benny changed to himself and descended quickly into the grass. He landed on the logo in the center of the field and powered down the blades. He looked around, brow furrowing at the fact that no soldiers were coming to unload him. What the fuck? He asked nobody in particular, and got out of the chopper. He looked around, confused. There was a torrent of gunfire nearby, but nobody was at the football field. Something ain't right. He drew his sidearm, readying it, and walked towards the main building at the western edge of the field. When he reached the gate, he opened it up and stepped into the parking lot. He spotted a figure beside a car, and his shoulders tensed when he realized they weren't standing like a live human. Benny aimed his handgun at them, inching forward to get a better look. The legs twitched slightly, like a corpse reanimating, putting him on edge. He took a deep breath and hopped around the side of the car, eyes widening as he spotted a pair of bloodied men in combat fatigues, munching away at another dead soldier. He studied his aim, thankful that the ghouls hadn't taken notice of him yet. He fired once, striking one of the runners in the head, and adjusted his aim quickly as the second creature stood up to rush him. Benny was just quick enough, the bullet hitting the corpse in the forehead, sending it tumbling to the ground. The pilot stepped up to the dinner buffet on the ground, the soldier's chest torn wide open. Guts were strewn across the pavement, a gooey mess all around. Benny paused for a moment, his mind flicking through graphic flashbacks to years gone by. He finally shook himself out of it and put a round in the dead soldier's skull. Man, fuck this, he thought frantically. If they're behind the line, there's not a damn thing I can do about it. He clenched his jaw, trying to get his head on straight. He wanted to go back to the helicopter and get the hell out of Dodge. It finally clicked that this was his only course of action, and he started moving back the way he'd come. The trip was short-lived, however, when he reached the gate to the field. He froze, eyes widening. On the other side, dozens of runners emerged, racing towards him at an alarming pace. He contemplated making a run for the chopper, but shook his head side to side. That's a fucking fantasy if you ever heard one, he muttered to himself, rubbing his forehead. Think, man, think. He looked around frantically, trying to find somewhere to hide. Hey, mister, over here, a woman called from a building across the street. Hurry! Benny didn't have time for a second thought, and broke into a run as fast as he could. As he reached the street, he looked down the road, spotting several more runners who turned their attention towards him. Don't look, just run, the woman screamed. Benny pumped his legs as hard as he could, racing towards the small business building across from the field. Two young privates stood in the doorway, waving frantically at him to come in. The runners made up ground quick, and his heart roared in his ears to drown out the sound of the undead footfalls hot on his heels. One of the soldiers fired off several rounds from the doorway, striking the lead creatures in the chest, causing them to stumble. They weren't kill shots, but at least they bought Benny the precious seconds he needed to reach safety. He flew past the soldier duo in the building, and they slammed the door securing it. Seconds later the zombies outside thrashed against it, desperate for the meal they'd lost. Benny leaned over, gasping for air, heart hammering in his chest. Are you okay, mister? the young female private asked. The pilot held up a finger as he caught his breath to signify he needed a second. Bartlett, the male soldier said, patting her on the shoulder. Why don't you get our new friend here some water? He watched her go and then grabbed a rolling chair from behind one of the desks and slid it over. Here, have a seat. I'm Sellers, by the way. Benny happily flopped back into the chair, leaning back and closing his eyes for a moment 
as his breathing steadied. "'Sorry it's not cold,' Bartlett said as she held out a bottle of water to him. Benny smiled and nodded, practically tearing the cap off and downing half of the bottle in a single gulp. "'Ah, it's all right,' he replied after the hearty swallow. "'That hit the spot just the way it was. Glad I could help,' the young blonde soldier replied with a smile. "'Now that you can speak again,' Sellers continued, "'you want to tell us what in the hell you're doing out here?' The pilot nodded. "'Name's Benny,' he said, putting a hand against his chest. "'I'm the helicopter pilot bringing you boys—' He paused, glancing at Bartlett. "'Ahem. I mean, bringing you troops, some more ammo. Captain McCall said you were in some trouble, and god damn was he not kidding.' "'Yeah, it's been a shit catastrophe ever since they ordered us forward,' Sellers agreed. "'We started having casualties on the second block because we were moving too quickly.' Bartlett jerked a thumb over her shoulder. "'And that was ten blocks ago,' she added. "'Maybe more.' "'How did you get stuck here?' Benny asked, eyes widening. "'Back at the ship they said you had a multi-block perimeter.' Sellers scoffed. Wishful thinking on somebody's part, he muttered. We had a few good choke points for those things set up covering every direction, but all it takes is one of those getting overrun to set off a chain reaction. Runners, the pilot replied. Both privates nodded solemnly. Sellers and I were in a group to the east, Bartlett continued. On the other side of the field, we heard constant fire all around us, but we couldn't figure out why. The other soldier pulled up his own chair and sat down. Then, all of a sudden, there was nothing coming from one side of us, he said. At first we got excited, thinking they had fended them off. But we were wrong. He lowered his gaze. Those things hit hard and fast, coming out of the neighborhood, Bartlett said, motioning wildly with her hands. Beside us, in front of us, hell, some of them even got behind us. Sellers leaned back in his chair with a huff. After that, it was every man for himself he explained. There were fifty, sixty of us in that particular group. Bartlett and I managed to get across the field okay, but we don't have any idea what happened to the others. I saw some taking shelter in some houses, but they were fighting those things off while trying to get in, she said, and then swallowed hard. I... I don't know if they made it. Sellers motioned to the door. We managed to get here and have been holed up ever since, he said. Neither one of us has a radio, so all we can do is wait and hope that somebody comes to get us. Benny patted his belt, and then his stomach sank when he realized that the radio was still in the chopper. Well, shit, he groaned. I was all primed and ready to be the hero there, but it would appear as though I left my walkie-talkie in the chopper. Well, it's the thought that counts, Bartlett replied with a soft smile. The pilot shrugged. I can tell you that the higher-ups know y'all are in a heap of trouble, he said. So they are sending a team in to relieve the pressure on you. So what do we do in the meantime? Sellers asked, spreading his arms. Benny smirked and reached into his shirt, pulling out his flask and wiggling it in the air. Sellers grinned ear to ear, but Bartlett frowned. What's wrong there, little lady? The pilot asked. She pursed her lips. Never had a drink before. Well, that settles it, Benny declared, holding out the flask. You're first. She reluctantly took it, unscrewing the cap and taking a whiff. She grimaced and then shrugged and took a big sip. The other two laughed as she dissolved into a coughing fit. Oh, God, she gasped. It tastes like fire. Benny grinned as he took the flask back. Don't worry. One day, sooner rather than later, if you're lucky, that burn will be a welcome sensation, he declared, and raised the flask in a toast before taking a hearty sip. Bartlett laughed and shook her head, and took a seat in their little circle to wait out the storm. Chapter 12 Three hours later, the trio lounged around the room, feet up, ankles crossed. The gunfire outside had become more sporadic in the last hour, but the banging on the door by the ghouls hadn't let up even for a minute. I really wish they would give it a rest, Sellers moaned. You'd think by now they'd know they aren't getting in. Benny shook his head. Those fuckers are persistent, he replied. 
If they think food is inside, they'll stand there for days on end to get it. He held up a finger. On the plus side, their devotion to dinner is giving us a realistic chance of beating them. Could have fooled us, Bartlett retorted. The pilot rocked the chair a little as he replied. Yeah, you've had some setbacks. But we had setbacks in Spokane and got through it. He offered her a smile. We'll get through this too. You were in Spokane? Sellers asked. Benny nodded. Yep, they found me at the airport early on and put my old ass back into service. He replied with a grin. Back into service? Bartlett asked, eyes widening. You served? He saluted her. Yes, ma'am, he said. Flew choppers in Vietnam. Wasn't exactly my first choice of a career path, but the military wasn't inclined to ask my opinion on the matter. How was it over there? She asked, lowering her legs and leaning forward in her chair. I mean, I've seen stuff on TV and, you know, platoon and full metal jacket. But those don't really tell everything, you know? Benny chuckled. Yeah. A bunch of pampered actors going back to their comfy trailers every night doesn't really tell everything, he agreed. Well, fill us in then. What was it like over there? Sellers asked. It's not like we're going anywhere anytime soon. The pilot looked down and then pulled out his flask, unscrewing the cap and taking a long sip. Okay, I'll tell you a little to pass the time, he conceded, though his voice had lost its luster. Hopefully it'll get our minds off of the constant goddamn knocking. Not going to go too deep, though. I've blocked a lot of that shit out of my head over the years. Stuff nobody ever needed to see. The two young soldiers nodded and focused on him intently. They'd seen some horrific things recently, too. Everyone had. And realized that talking about it wasn't going to be easy for many in the coming months or years. I was fortunate enough to not be on the front lines, Benny began, licking his lips. At least, not for any significant length of time. Just shuffling boys to the front and bringing the broken ones back for some care. He paused, taking another sip. Oh, burial. Even the ones that did come back unscathed didn't really come back. I could see it in their eyes, like they left themselves back in the jungle. He looked up at the two soldiers, still a bit shell-shocked from the day, seeing the same look in their eyes as he'd seen in the Vietnam-era troops. They were so young. He took a deep breath, changing tack. But the most memorable moment I had over there came when we were on leave, he said, brightening. I forget which city we were in. Hell, even if I remember it, there's zero fucking chance I could pronounce it. There was a group of us pilots that ran together, and we'd go out drinking and causing a ruckus. We didn't see frontline action, so we got our kicks starting trouble and running from the MPs. We figured worst case, we'd spend a night cooling off in the clink, which was usually quieter and more private than the barracks. He chuckled to himself and then took another sip, offering the flask to the kids but they both shook their heads to decline. So, there were six of us at the bar, he continued, about ten rounds deep when somebody made the suggestion that we should all go to a brothel. Bartlett held up a hand. That person was you, wasn't it? she asked. The pilot smirked. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told the judge a few years back, he drawled. I bleed the fifth. The soldiers laughed, loosening up a bit. So, as that mysterious, unnamed person continued to push that particular idea, Benny continued, the mischievous glint in his eye, the enthusiasm around the table was, how they say, waning, until old Charlie Weber said the phrase that I'm sure haunts him to this day. He raised his eyes to the ceiling and made his voice as high-pitched as he could make it. Nah, I'm good. I want my first time to be special. Both soldiers' eyes widened, and Bartlett clapped a hand over her mouth, causing Benny to laugh. That was the exact look we gave him as well, he assured them, shaking his head. It was like a light switch flipping. All of a sudden, this was the greatest idea ever conceived of by man. So we tell the bartender what our evening plans are and how we need a special time for our friend here, 
He raised his hands to do air quotes for special. Now, I don't know if this bartender hated us American boys, or if he was on the same page as us, but he sent us to a place none of us will ever forget. So we walked down a few blocks, making a turn into an alley and knocking on the back door of some place. This ratchety-looking dude opened the door with a sawed-off shotgun in his hand, yelling in some language we didn't understand. He only stopped when I showed him the map on the bar coaster that the bartender drew for us. After that, this asshole became sunshine and rainbows. That's always a good sign, Bartlett quipped, sarcasm dripping from her tone. Nothing concerning about that at all. Benny let out a self-deprecating laugh, scratching the back of his head. Well, when you're ten rounds deep, the only concerning thing in your mind is the thought that there won't be an eleventh round, he explained. Anyway, we go into this place, and it's a seedy-looking, velvet-covered, interior-design nightmare place. Of course, none of us were focused on that. Only the ladies in skimpy sleepwear that started coming out of the back room to join us. He tilted his head back for a moment, rubbing his forehead. While we were all enticed by the attention, this mean, older-looking woman came out. She was dressed to the nines, makeup and hair done up nice. Of course, even with that, you could tell she had been there way too many years. She made a beeline up to us, but stops by the doorman who whispers in her ear, causing her to get this devious grin on her face. The first words out of her mouth after that were, Who's my special boy? We all immediately pointed to Charlie. The soldiers let out a horrified laughter. Sellers covered his eyes with his hand and moaned, Oh God, she didn't? Yep, she did, Benny confirmed, nodding sagely. She walked right over to old Charlie, grabbed him by the hand, and dragged him kicking and screaming to the back. All of that prime, he choked back the word, glancing at Bartlett. I mean, all of those lovely ladies that would have enjoyed an evening with Charlie, and he ended up with the war horse. The rest of the night is kind of a blur. Last thing I remember is them bringing out a couple of bottles of something strong. He shook his head. We must have found our way home, because we woke up in the barracks the next morning. Most of us spent the morning rubbing our heads to get the pounding to stop, and I'm pretty sure I was the only one to come back with any money left in my pockets. Sellers leaned forward on his knees. And Charlie? He never spoke of that night to any of us. Benny replied, slapping his thigh. But you could see it in his eyes. Something happened in that back room. Bartlett chuckled, crossing her arms. Well, he said he wanted his first time to be special, she said. And you gave him that. Did you even listen to the story? Sellers asked, turning to her with an incredulous look on his face. She rolled her eyes. I did, and I'm never going to forget it. And I wasn't even there, she replied. Pretty sure old Charlie is never going to forget it either. Benny barked a laugh and wagged a finger at her. You're a live one, he said. I like you. The group shared another laugh and then froze when they heard the gunfire picking up outside. A moment later, the banging on the door ceased. Anybody else hear that? Benny asked, pointing to the door. His companions nodded and he sighed with relief. Good. Wasn't just my mind breaking, as usual, he said. The trio rose to their feet and rushed to the window, peeking out. The zombies in the front of the building had rushed away, and they spotted them running towards a large group of soldiers in the street a couple of blocks up. Everybody down now, Benny yelled, and pulled his young companions away from the windows as gunfire erupted from outside. It was sustained for a few moments, with a few strays piercing the windows and front wall of the building. When it died down, they peeled themselves off of the floor. Everybody good? Benny asked, looking at each of them in turn. At their nod, he waved a hand for them to follow him. Good. Let's go greet our rescuers. He led them outside, making sure to wave frantically as he emerged, so that the soldiers down the street would know they were alive. The soldiers lowered their guns and waved back, heading their way. You three okay? The lead soldier asked. Benny chuckled darkly. Yeah, just peachy, he replied. How are y'all? 
The soldier blinked at him for a beat, and then stammered. I'm good, sir, he pointed to the two privates. You two, report to Sergeant Miller up the road a few blocks. He'll tell you where to go. He turned his gaze back to the pilot. Sir, if you want to remain in the building, we'll have a transport team here in a couple of hours that will get you to safety. No can do, son, Benny replied, raising his palms. I got places to be. The soldier straightened his shoulders. Sir, with all due respect, that wasn't a request, he said firmly. And with all due respect, I don't give a fuck, Benny snapped, pointing a finger at him. Now, I need you to get a few of your men here to come help me unload my chopper that's parked in the field out there so I can get back to doing my fucking job, which is bringing you boys ammo and rations. You think you can handle that? The soldier blinked at him, flabbergasted, and then glanced over at the field, spotting the helicopter. Is that what's in the chopper? he asked. Ammo and rations? Yep, Benny replied, crossing his arms. The soldier turned and whistled. Four of you, on me, he barked, and then motioned to the troops that rushed up. You four, he glanced at Bartlett and Sellers. Hell, you six, go with the pilot and get the resupply unloaded. Move! Appreciate it, soldier, Benny said. The soldier nodded. My pleasure, sir, he replied politely, remorse laced in his tone. Happy flying, and keep those supplies coming. We're going to need them. No doubt, Benny replied, and followed the six soldiers through the field. It took a few minutes, but they managed to get all the supplies unloaded, and Benny climbed up into the helicopter. Sellers, Bartlett, he said, nodding to the young privates. Glad we got to spend some time together. Sellers grinned. Pleasure was ours, sir, he said. When we get this place pacified... The pilot continued. Don't be afraid to look me up. First round is on me. Bartlett smirked. If we hit round ten, then maybe we can get Sellers here his special night, she teased. Benny barked a laugh and wagged his finger at her. Love the live ones, he said, and winked at her. Ten rounds it is. Now, you'll be safe out there. He hopped into the hot seat, firing up the chopper, and lifted off giving a little wave to the soldiers on the ground before heading for the ship. Chapter 13 Benny landed on the deck, surprising some of the soldiers. It took a moment before they leapt into action and started working on the chopper, but he hopped down and strolled right past them, not saying a word. He walked into the ready room as casual as a cat, and Captain McCall leapt up from his desk. Good... God, man, are you okay? He demanded. You've been gone for hours. Benny spread his arms and shrugged. Yeah, the landing site got overrun, he explained. And I had to wait to be rescued. He unbuckled the gun holster, but the captain held up a hand to stop him. Consider it yours for as long as you need it, he insisted. The pilot nodded and closed the buckle again. Thanks, although I could probably use another mag, he said. Had to put it into action right after landing. McCall whistled sharply and pointed to a soldier that darted over to them. Give the man your mags, he instructed. The young soldier didn't even miss a beat, just took out a few mags and handed them over before rushing back to the wall to continue working. So, Benny drawled as he pocketed them, what's the next mission of the day? The captain motioned for him to follow and headed over to a map of downtown. Welcome to downtown Seattle, he said. If everything goes to plan by morning, we're going to be pushing on towards it to clear it out. Those strafing runs to the east were very effective, and the group that rescued you is going to be pushing across the bridge this evening, which means it's time to get snipers in place. Benny nodded, letting out a sigh of relief. After the last few runs, I'm perfectly okay with staying a couple hundred yards off of the ground, he admitted. Then this mission has your name all over it. McCall replied. Shouldn't be too difficult. You're going to have eight men to a trip. He pointed to various spots on the map as he spoke. And we're just going to have you drop them off at these locations. Once you do, I'd like you to do some aerial recon for us of the immediate area. Aerial recon? Benny asked. Thought you had real-time satellite uplinks. The captain cocked his head. We do, he replied. But they're concentrated on the current front lines. You don't have to spend long on it, just get up there and see what you can see. 
If we're walking into a shit show, it would be nice to know ahead of time. Captain, with the way this week is going, the pilot drawled, is there really any question about whether or not it's a shit show? McCall sighed and shook his head. From your mouth to God's ears, he muttered, and then pointed to a nearby soldier. He'll have your flight plan for you. Snipers are getting geared up and we'll meet you on the deck in ten. He turned away, but then raised a hand and turned back. Oh, and I'll be on comm, so if there's a problem, just radio it in and we'll mark it. Benny nodded and grabbed his flight plan from the soldier on the way back out to the deck. The mechanics were still giving his helicopter some love, so he wandered over to the edge, looking out over the water. The sun wasn't low, but it was certainly on the way down. It would be a couple of hours at most before he'd be night flying. Yeah, Benny, night flying ain't that bad. Even on with as little sleep you've gotten this week, he thought to himself. You could be on the ground pushing forward. He took a deep breath and thought about the dangerous spot these soldiers were in, especially kids like Sellers and Bartlett. Chapter 14 Benny flew the chopper towards downtown with eight snipers in tow. In the distance, plumes of smoke rose into the air. Looks like someone is having some fun with Molotov cocktails, he thought, smiling to himself. Either that, or someone found a flamethrower. When they got closer, he looked straight down on the streets, seeing them completely packed with ghouls. Shoulder to shoulder they spread through the downtown core like rivers of death. One of the snipers, Rich, sat in the passenger seat and adjusted his headset so he could converse with the pilot. There's a whole lot of heads in need of shooting down there, he declared. Benny wrinkled his nose. Given that we got off the ground, he drawled, I'm fairly confident that you boys don't have enough ammo to make that happen. Just means you have to bring us some backup rounds, Rich replied with a smile. The pilot inclined his head. Only if I get to squeeze off a few rounds with your rifle there, he said mischievously. Those fuckers are packed so tight I'm bound to hit something. You got a deal, the sniper replied, giving him a thumbs up. Most of our job is to distract them, so you won't be doing any harm. Benny grinned. I'm gonna hold you to that, he declared, and then looked around at the several target buildings coming into view. You boys have a preference? he asked. You want the top of the world, or something a little more down to earth? Down to earth, if you don't mind, Rich replied. Less wind blowing in our faces and pushing our shots every which way. Let those slackers who didn't volunteer to go first deal with that. Benny nodded. You got it, he said, and chuckled at the surly sniper. He found the shortest building on his target list, a fifteen-story hotel near the north of town. Hang tight, we're coming in. He picked his spot on the roof and lowered down perfectly, barely jostling his passengers. As soon as they touched down, the soldiers cracked open the door and filed out. Before Rich slipped out, he gave Benny a fist bump. We'll see you soon, he promised. My gun will be ready for you to fire. Gonna be a blast, the pilot replied. Y'all stay safe. Rich jumped down and slammed the door shut, before moving back with his team. Benny lifted off to do his tour of the city, giving them a wave as he left. When he had a good view of the downtown area, he pulled out his radio and called back to the ship. Captain McCall, do you copy? he asked. A moment later, the captain came back. What you got for me, Benny? Downtown is a total clusterfuck, Benny explained. Roads are packed thick with those things, and it's going to be a bitch and a half to clear them out. We figured as much, McCall replied and we think we have a plan for that. Benny's brow furrowed. You think you have a plan? He asked. That's comforting to know. We've had to use up a lot of resources so far, the captain explained. So the initial plans are out the window. We gotta think on our feet. Benny sighed. Yeah, I'll buy that, he admitted. I'm gonna head south and work my way back up the eastern side. Copy that, McCall replied. He flew to the south end of town, seeing there was a lot of empty space. There were still thousands of ghouls on the streets, but they were spread out, unlike the traffic jam downtown. 
That island diversion is still holding strong, he murmured. He found the coastline and started moving up north, keeping an eye on the ground below. Tons of zombies moved about, but nothing too concerning. The area around the I-90 bridge leading to Mercer Island was a bit crowded, but they were well equipped to handle that problem. He raised the radio to his lips. Captain, just past the I-90 bridge, he said. It's a bit crowded, but I'm pretty sure you already knew that. Yeah, those boys have it locked down pretty good, McCall replied, so we're not too concerned. Okay, moving up to check out the northeast, Benny replied, and continued flying to the northeast portion of the bridge, leading down. As he grew closer, concern tightened in his belly. Not only were the streets packed with zombies, but even the grassy areas were covered. Thousands, tens of thousands, all packed together moved northward. With so much gunfire and being so far away from Mercer Island, every undead body and their brother was headed that way. The pilot was about to call it in when he paused, flying over a large park a few blocks east of the interstate. It was less than a mile to the bridge that the northern group would be pushing down from. The entire park was packed, looking like an out-of-control zombie music festival. His eyes widened, and he raised the radio to his mouth. Captain, we may have a problem to the north, he said quickly. What do you see? McCall asked. Benny shook his head. I'm at some park just south of the bridge and this place is hopping, he replied. There's probably ten, fifteen thousand zombies just about there in the open. It's going to be hell to push through them. Sadly, there isn't much we can do about it, the captain said. We have a limited supply of missiles, and they're not keen on using them just on packs of zombies. Has to be some pressing issue to break them out. The pilot clucked his tongue. What about the Apaches, then? he asked. Those miniguns will clear them out, right? Same thing, McCall countered, though he at least sounded regretful. Limited resources that they're holding in their back pocket. Benny growled. That's bullshit, he spat. For once, I agree with you, the captain said dryly. But to somebody higher up, troops are easier to replace than weaponry. And unfortunately, this just doesn't cut it. The pilot fumed, clamping his mouth shut. McCall sighed through the speaker. I know you're pissed. Believe me, I am too, he admitted. But there's nothing we can do. Why don't you come back to the ship and pick up another batch of shooters? Benny took a deep breath. Captain, I have an idea he said. I'm listening, McCall replied. Some sergeant down at Renton Airport jury-rigged some firebombs to clear out some of those things on the interstate, the pilot explained. He said he was making a few more up. It might not clear them all out, but should put a dent in them. What do you say? There was a long pause, and then finally the captain said, I say go for it, but if anybody asks you told me to go fuck myself and did it anyway. Benny barked a laugh. Don't worry, he said. If it comes to that, I'll make it sound believable. I don't doubt it, McCall replied, chuckling. I'll let the snipers know you'll be running behind. Be safe and happy hunting. Benny put the radio down and swooped towards the Renton airport, flying as fast as his bird would go. Chapter 15 Benny landed at the airport and quickly powered down, hopping out of the chopper before the blades finished spinning. A soldier approached him immediately. Where's Sergeant Farley? Benny asked before the soldier could speak. I think he's around here somewhere, the private replied. The pilot nodded. Take me to him quickly, he urged, and the soldier nodded, motioning for the older man to follow. They moved at a power walk into one of the hangars where Farley and Barnes stood around several oil drums. Sergeant Farley, the soldier called as they approached. This man needs to speak with you. Farley turned and spotted Benny, and his face lit up in a smile. I tell you what, you have impeccable timing, he exclaimed. We just got something special rigged up. Good, because we need it, the pilot replied, taking a deep breath. Barnes's brow furrowed. There another horde on the interstate? We need to take something up to the northern group, Benny replied, shaking his head. They're pushing towards downtown, and they're in some trouble. 
Farley smacked his hand down on one of the six oil drums in the center of the room. Well, this will certainly do the trick. This looks a little bigger than the other ones, Benny mused. The sergeant grinned. Pack a hell of a bigger punch, too, he declared. Found a stash of jet fuel and filled these puppies up. Jet fuel? the pilot asked, shocked and amused. Here I was thinking we were just going to burn these things up. And here you are, ready to reduce them to liquid. I'm fucking in. Barnes clapped his hands together. So, what are we dealing with up there? Ten, maybe fifteen thousand of those things in a park, Benny replied, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. The northern force is pushing south over the bridge, and these things are ready to meet them head on. If we can clear them out, or at least thin their numbers, they should be able to get a foothold on the right side of the bridge. Farley nodded. No time like the present, he said, and moved behind one of the drums. Let's start wheeling these things out. How are we detonating them? Benny asked. Pretty sure flaming rags aren't going to cut it this time. Barnes grinned and held up a block of plastic explosive. Little C4 should do the trick. I would tell Captain McCall what we're doing, Benny drawled, putting a finger to his chin. But from the looks of it, he's going to hear about it right after it happens anyway. The sergeant held out his hand and tilted it back and forth. Probably, he said. Does your bird out there have an under-attachment? Yeah, got a hook with a remote release, the pilot replied. Why? Farley smirked. Oh, you'll see. The men laughed as the sergeant motioned to some other soldiers to start moving the barrels outside. Ten minutes later, the half-dozen barrels were on the runway, bundled together tightly on top of a heavy-duty net. Once they were on there, they wrapped them up and prepped the whole shebang to be lifted off of the ground by the chopper. That is one big-ass bomb, Benny breathed as he stared at their handiwork. Barnes crossed his arms, puffing out his chest. I gotta tell you, Sarge, that's a piece of work, he agreed. You got the detonator? Farley asked. Barnes held it up, a big grin on his face, rivaling a kid's at Christmas. Ready to lay waste to some zombies? Then let's make it happen, the sergeant replied. Benny, you mind dropping us after? he asked. The pilot shook his head. Not at all, he replied. Just wouldn't be fair if you did all the work and didn't get to see it go off. Let's ride. The trio got into the helicopter, and Benny fired it up, lifting up and hovering over the makeshift bomb. The ground's crew successfully attached it to the bottom, and he took off. There was a bit of a drag on the chopper as it struggled for a moment to carry the weight, but once they got going, it was smooth sailing. The trip took a bit of extra time, and Barnes and Farley took in the bird's-eye view of the battlefield. Even as the sun began to set in the west, they could still see the zombies stretched out from the coastline, plumes of smoke rising in the distance, as God only knew what was burning. How would you like to be on that cleanup crew? Farley asked, leaning in. Barnes shook his head vigorously. I'm quite content being on the demolition crew, thank you very much. Farley laughed and smacked his partner on the back. The rest of the ride was spent in relative silence as they watched the zombie hordes below growing in size in an almost mesmerizing fashion. Finally, they arrived at the park, hovering five hundred yards above the mass below. Benny waved for Farley to come closer. I know this is going to be a big one, the pilot began, but realistically, how big are we talking? Just trying to figure out how far away we need to be so we don't get caught up in it. The sergeant licked his lips nervously. I'll be honest, never done anything this big he admitted. I'd say you can't go wrong going up to a thousand yards and then hauling ass after you drop the load. That detonator have a good enough range on it for that kind of escape? Benny asked, inclining his head to Barnes. Oh yeah, Farley assured him. It's rated for a mile, and with as heavy as that thing is, it won't take that long to hit the ground. The pilot nodded. All right, I'll get in position, he replied, and gave the sergeant a thumbs up. He rose into the air, hitting a thousand yards up, hovering over the center of the park. He looked down to make sure he was right in the middle. Even if the wind catches it, that thing won't get outside of the park, he thought.
and even if it does, there's still going to be massive damage done. He turned and gave the boys a wave, and Barnes held up the detonator, flicking it on so that it was armed. Benny took a deep breath, hitting the necessary switches on the console. Beneath the chopper, the click of the unlatching mechanism holding the bomb was loud. A moment later, it was free, tumbling to the ground below. He immediately started moving forward as fast as the bird would go. Barnes kept a close eye on the bomb as it hurtled for the park, and just before it hit the grass, he pulled the trigger on the detonator. The sound was deafening, the shockwave lurching the chopper forward. Benny struggled for control, keeping his breathing steady as he fought it, but quickly regained it. He breathed a sigh of relief as he looked out of his now cracked windshield. God damn, that was a hell of a blast, he muttered, and then turned around so they could get a good view of things. The sight was spectacular. The bomb illuminated the dusky sky, the cloud of smoke rising above the height of the helicopter. They looked to the ground below, and it was a wasteland. Charred bodies, trees ripped from the root, nary a corpse still standing. For a moment, they sat in amazement, triumph blooming in their chest. The radio blipped and Farley laughed. Uh-oh, Benny, looks like you're in trouble, he teased. Oh, now, what are they going to do? The pilot asked playfully, rolling his eyes. Retire me to a comfy life of not flying into danger? The sergeant cocked his head. Shit, if they're going to do that, tell them it was all my idea, he offered. Benny picked up the radio and raised it to his lips. I had a feeling you might be calling, he said calmly. I was going to ask how the mission was going, McCall said. But we heard that blast all the way out here. What in the hell did you do? The pilot smirked. Have you ever seen a barrel of jet fuel detonate, Captain? Can't say that I have, McCall admitted. Benny grinned. Well, now you can say that you've heard six of them detonate, he declared. Jesus Christ, McCall blurted, laughing. Well, was it successful? The pilot nodded. Oh, yeah. Leveled the entire park, he said, and probably some of the nearby houses as well. Well, that's good, because I just got word that the northern forces moved across the bridge and are headed south as we speak, McCall replied. Benny smiled. That is good news, Captain, he said. As soon as I drop off my two accomplices, he paused, winking at Farley. I mean, passengers. I'll be back to the ship to pick up the next load of snipers. I'll make sure they're ready, McCall said. And Benny? The pilot's brow furrowed. Yeah? Good job out there. The captain replied firmly. Benny just smiled and put down the radio. You boys ready to head back? He asked. Whenever you are, Farley replied, patting him on the shoulder. We're on your schedule. The pilot nodded and continued to hover, taking one last look at the explosion site. It had been a long day, but he took pride in the amount of good he'd been able to accomplish. After that brief moment of enjoying the feeling, he maneuvered the helicopter to head back to Renton Airport. There was a lot more to get done before the assault on downtown was complete. The End Up next, a group of civilians risk their lives to warn the military of a deadly threat in Seattle, Part 8.